Association of Lake County. I'm Russ Littlefield, president of UUCLC. Unitarian Universalism has a long history of working for social justice everywhere in the world. And our congregation is proud to be sponsoring this lecture series. This is just part of our social justice and environmental work in Lake County in Central Florida. These lectures are offered every other Sunday on a theme of social justice and environment. Tonight's lecture is by Jeannie Economos, who will be speaking on where can our farm workers find justice? Before we welcome Jeannie, however, I want to turn this over to Val Rosado, a member of our UU technical team, who will tell you how you can use the chat feature of Zoom to submit questions. Val? Hi. In case some of you are new to Zoom, there were a couple things I'd like to point out. One is that there are two different views that you have of people who are in the meeting. Uh, one is called gallery view, and that's where you see a bunch of little pictures of each person. Uh, there's also speaker view, which highlights the speaker and makes that person's face large with just a few of the other people. Uh, you can still see the other people by using arrows at the end of the row. Um, we have muted everyone's microphone so that we can best hear the speaker, so please don't unmute your yourselves. Uh, we don't want to hear your dog barking or uh, the kitchen implements whirring or whatever. So we would appreciate your staying muted. There will be time for questions at the end and we'll take those questions by using the chat feature of Zoom. If you look around your screen, uh, probably either on the bottom, although it could be the top or the side, you'll see the word chat. Where you see it depends on what kind of device you're using, a computer, a phone, a tablet. And um, if you see that chat button, if you click on it, which you can do now if you wanna try it out, um, you'll see that some people have already asked some questions. And if during the talk you have a question you'd like answered, if you would put it in the chat box, then we will get to those at the end of the meeting. All you do is type down at the bottom where it says to everyone, you type what your question is and be sure when you finish typing to press enter, um, there's no button that says submit or yes or anything like that. So just be sure you press enter at the end of it. And um, we'll get to as many questions as we can when the lecture is over. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you, Val. Now I am going to light a chalice. The chalice is the logo of the Unitarian Universalist Association, of which our congregation is a member. We are proud of its source in World War II, when Unitarians were active in helping Eastern Europeans as fleeing Hitler and Nazism escape to, escape to safety. It has become a universal symbol of Unitarian Universalist commitment to truth and social justice. May the words that we are about to hear take root in our heart that we may be inspired to speak and act in ways that make for a beloved community. Here at UUCLC, we put a high premium on compassion. We call it siding with love. Our speaker tonight, Jeannie Economos, is a perfect example of, of someone who has for many years sided with love. She has worked for years to protect some of the most vulnerable people in the United States, the farm workers. Their vulnerable status has often seen them left out of conversations surrounding issues like protection from pesticides and climate change. 
Working out of the Apopka office, Jeannie has been their untiring advocate. She currently serves as Pesticide Safety and Environmental Health Project Coordinator at the Farm Worker Association. She is also a coordinator of the Lake Apopka Memorial Quilt Project. This project memorializes the former farm workers on Lake Apopka who were exposed to toxic pesticides in the vegetable fields in, on one of Florida's most contaminated large lakes. We are very pleased to have her here as, as our speaker tonight. Please, Jeannie. Thank you very much. And I do have to wear a mask right now, so please let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. Um, you can raise your hand in the chat if you have any trouble hearing my voice. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm very grateful and honored to be able to talk to you all tonight. So thank you very much for having me. And I also want to say that there couldn't be a more appropriate time. The Farm Worker Association of Florida has been around for 37 years. And for 37 years, we've been telling people, students, churches, civic groups, other kinds of communities, that farm workers today are living the legacy of slavery. For too long, that's been only words. And now for the first time with this Black Lives Matter movement, we feel that the lid has blown off. The lies that have been told around our society and our government and the United States for decades and for centuries. So the reality is that farm workers living in the United States today are living the legacy of slavery. And that is not just a description, that's reality. And we're gonna talk about that today we're going to start out talking a little bit about health and safety related to the history of pesticides in the, United, in, in, in the world and in the United States and how that history affects what's happening today with farm workers because there's a convergence. There's a convergence of an economic crisis, a health crisis, and the lid is blown off the racial and the colonial history of this country. And we also have a crisis of our government. So this is a way to bring all those elements. So, oh, can you hear me? I, it's like I was muted. To some of the most important people in our country, the people who harvest the food that the rest of us eat. So we can go to the first slide. I have to say that um, I don't get credit for this PowerPoint presentation. A colleague at another organization, the Northwest Center for Pesticides, uh, created this a PowerPoint, but I think it's so relevant right now to where we are in this country um, with all these converging issues. So I'm going to give a brief history of the origin of pesticide use in the United States looking at major points at the turn of the 20th century that has led us to where we are today. And um, it's become very difficult to separate pesticide use and the political economy of our now industrialized food system and the history of racism in this country. Um, we're gonna go all the way back to the origins of agriculture. Um, settled agriculture actually began in the Middle East in uh, some 10,000 years ago, when nomadic peoples began to settle down and, um, and begin to form societies around uh, crop production. And with that advent of what was the root of our agricultural system today was also the beginning of a hierarchy, hierarchy a system of hierarchy and class that had not been present before. And that led to the amassing of wealth of some people and the exploitation of labor of other people. And that 10,000 year legacy of, of exploitation of labor is some of the roots of where we are today. So um, next slide. 
so we're going to talk a little bit about pesticide use and then bring that around to um, other racial issues today. Um, so agriculture is about 10,000 years old, but pest control has existed as long as people have depended on agriculture. Um, but in the, in originally there were safe methods of pesticide um, um, use uh, or methods to try and uh, save the crops. And people even worship cats um, to try and uh, have their crops grow better. So you can see um, this here from, you know, some, from um, centuries ago, uh, millennial ago. Uh, next slide, please. So early pesticide use um, in Mesopotamia, um, very natural substances like sulfur were used um, to um, prevent um, insect and mite infections, infestations, and chemicals were used. Mercury and arsenic were some of the chemical compounds that were used then. Other um, methods that were used were natural methods like fire, smoke, tar, salt water and plant extracts. Um, but the indigenous methods um, of using safe methods of rotating crops, using um, multiple crops in the same place, those were becoming less and less, those are being destroyed by colonization. And I will say that arsenic use um, has been used up until recent years and including in central Florida on orange crops. So arsenic use began, you know, some 5,000 years ago and it's still being used today. Next slide, please. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit, um, well, quite a bit. Um, in the United States, when the, the first settlers that came to the United States began small farming here, they, of course, stole indigenous people's lands and began small farming. But as the country grew and the population grew, you had big urban centers um, in the Northeast that began forming and there was a need for agriculture to feed the, the, the development of the country. So in the Southeast, as we know, in the 1600s, began the slave trade to the United States. And the plantation system began in the southern states. And slave labor was used, enslaved people, slave labor was used to build the economy of this country. And I've been saying that for years. But I think this time with this, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think people are really starting to internalize that and starting to recognize the real um, dark history there and really make the connection between the wealth of this country and um, the, the work of the slave trade in, in the southeastern states. So um, as the plantation system grew, plantation owners were growing crops in, um, in larger and larger acreage, and they had to use pesticides, or they thought they had to use pesticides. They were not using um, natural methods to grow their crops because it was all about profits. And so the labor was exploited so that the owners, the, pro the plantation owners could get more profits. And so all kinds of natural methods were set aside for just um, huge crop yields. And um, in the 1800s, we see that um, the arsenic-based insecticides were used. It's really important to understand who was exposed to these? So as time went on, increasing amounts of chemicals and uh, uh, metals were used on crops. And it was black people in the fields that were being exposed to these pesticides and insecticides. That's important. We're gonna talk about that some more. But if you think about that, you're thinking about generations of people exposed to chemicals in the workplace. And we talk today about disparities in health. Well, think about that as we're talking about this history of exposure to chemicals. So in the 1860s, um, the arsenic-based compounds were used. In um, um, 1897, Dow Chemical was founded. 
And, um, and then in 1901, we see um, Monsanto coming, um, being found, uh, uh, founded. And Monsanto was producing things like caffeine, vanilla, medical drugs. And later, they began to um, manufacture DDT to com combat malaria, typhus, and other insect-borne diseases. In the 1920s, people started getting sick from We lost you again, Jeannie, your sound. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yes. me? Okay, that's strange, sorry about that. Um, in, the, um, in the 1930s is when the labor, um, the major labor laws that affect all workers were passed in the United States. The National Labor Relations Act and the fair labor standards that gave workers the right to organize, the right to um, uh, overtime, um, a minimum wage, um, child protection against child labor. Those laws in the 1930s deliberately excluded farm workers and domestic workers. And that was at the behest of the agricultural industry, which by this time was very powerful. And um, if you think about the, the classes of workers that were excluded, farm workers and domestic workers, those jobs were the jobs that enslaved peoples did on plantations. They were the domestic workers and they were the people harvesting the crops in the fields. So you see a parallel here between the racism in labor laws and the racism in the use of pesticides in fields and the exposure of workers. Um, EDT was seen as a miracle product. Um, it became normalized. And a lot of the advertising that we use, was used for DDT actually had a very racist overtones. Um, during World War II, there was a dark history people really talk about, which is the US involvement in secret chemical experiments on World War II troops that grouped test subjects by race and skin tone in search of an ideal chemical soldier. This is in addition to the use of black, indigenous, and Puerto Rican soldiers on the front lines. While the exploitation, exploitation of workers was not a new concept to American agriculture, the Bracero program had a big influence on the dependence of foreign labor we see today. And the Bracero program was the program I think most people probably know about that um, that brought the Mexican workers into the United States to fill uh, labor spots that, um, that black, uh, black community was no longer doing because they had gone off to fight in the war. Um, in 1944, chemical companies began manufacturing DDT in the United States, and it was widely used during the second half of the uh, World War II. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, DDT was considered a miracle product. Um, the Bracero program started during um, the World War II to fill low paying positions that were left vacant um, by the, oh, no, can you go back one? Yeah, thank you, okay. Um, and then also in 1947, the um, DIFRA was passed. And FIFRA was supposed to regulate um, pesticide use uh, in the United States, but it was very weak and there was almost nothing in FIFRA to really protect um, farm workers. Um, we also see at this time um, the beginning of population growth and industrialized agriculture. So uh, next slide. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so in the 1950s, we have the beginning of the Green Revolution and agricultural mechanization. So a lot of people, the, the Green Revolution has, has for, for decades had a really good connotation as really producing all this food that was able to feed America. But what also was happening during the Green Revolution is that we were losing our topsoil. Um, we were polluting our soils with uh, chemical fertilizer 
and pesticides, and that had an effect on farm workers. Um, people that have heard me talk before about Lake Apopka know that a lot of the black farm workers in Central Florida were exposed to the worst class of pesticides, the organochlorine pesticides, which are considered um, a persistent organic pollutants. Um, they bioaccumulate up the food chain and they cause chronic health problems. Um, we also see in the 1950s in response to the um, working conditions that farm workers began to organize to demand better working conditions. It was mostly around wages, however, and the uh, issue of pesticides really didn't become a really big issue until later because the health effects weren't really known then. And um, in uh, 1955, during the Vietnam, uh, uh, the Vietnam War begins, and that's when we see chemicals being used as a, um, as a weapon. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation um, was, so the yeah, beginning of the Green Revolution was funded in part by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation, the true industry capitalists. Um, they were the business magnets that were leaders in industrial growth and they paved the way for the global food system we see today. Um, some of the things that were funded by those foundations included things like the eugenics project um, in, that was used in Nazi Germany and seed patenting in Mexico. So next slide. So um, in the 1960s, along comes Rachel Carson, who really began to expose, it was a real turning point. Um, to um, expose what Monsanto, Dow, and other chemical manufacturers were doing, exposing the true dangers of um, the pesticides that were being used, especially DDT. Um, and at the same time, um, the United Farm Workers were established and uh, Silent Spring was published. Um, Rachel Carson has been um, criticized for not being more aware of or not working more with the human health aspects of um, impacts to farm workers, but there has been some information uncovered that she really was sympathetic to that. She just didn't come out publicly with that. So in 1964, we have the end of the Bracero program, which was a really, let me talk a little bit about the Bracero program because it's important. Um, Black farm workers had been exposed to horrific conditions during slavery, of course, but even after slavery as indentured servants, sharecroppers, and then just as um, laborers. Um, I, I don't know whether you talked about that in the previous session, but we have a really horrible racist history here in Lake County and Orange County. In the Popka, for example, in the 1970s, if you were black and you were a farm worker, and if you were found on the wrong side of the tracks, a policeman could pick you up and you had three choices. You could go to prison, you could go into the army, or you could go work in the fields. And so that, and that, that racist history is not that long ago. I know a lot of people um, probably remember that because we were here at that time. Um, so it's really important to understand that. And then the, when the black farm workers began to be replaced by the Mexican farm workers. Um, and today it's uh, lots of um, different uh, Hispanic ethnic groups, but at that time it was mostly Mexicans. And the conditions that the Mexican farm workers were exposed to under the Bracero program were so horrendous that finally in 1964, the program was ended. And then we have 1966, where Dow Chemical um, patented chlorpyrifos, which is a pesticide. That was in 1996. This is 2020. We have been fighting against chlorpyrifos all that time. Uh, we're part of a lawsuit against the EPA for not banning chlorpyrifos, and I'm happy to talk about that later. This history is important because, again, Farm workers are in the fields and they're exposed to a toxic soup of pesticides. They're not exposed to just one or two different kinds of pesticides, they're exposed to multiple pesticides. 
well, what does this do? There hasn't been enough study, but we know that this can compromise their immune system. This can cause chronic health issues that can lead to um, uh, you know, health disparities later on in life. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, then we have the 1970s, and um, the, the big push is for globalization. Um, the EPA was established in 1970, and OSHA was established in 1971. Farmers were forced to get big or get out, and in fact, um, I think it was um, uh, Sonny Perdue who basically said that you know, when, he, when people complained to him that small farmers today were being pushed out, he said, well, they, no, I think actually that was Mike Pence, I apologize. Um, he, ba he basically said the same thing. Your solution is to get big or to get out. And that was driving small farmers out of business. Um, and the important thing is there's a, a really excellent book called Freedom Farmers. Um, that talks about the history of black farm ownership and um, how the black farmers in the southeast and around the country were using um, what we would now call sustainable methods for decades and decades. And they were doing agriculture. They're natural agriculturalists. Um, it was handed down for generations from ancestors that worked on plantations um, and a lot of those most a lot of those small farms especially the small black farms ex, um, faced awful discrimination and um, so many of them have closed because of our policies um, and um, and there, there's con continuing pressure on the small farms especially the minority small farms and especially today under the current economic crisis so in 1972, we have the Clean Water Act passed, uh, the Endangered Species Act passed in 1973, um, and the, uh, um, with concerns about pesticides in the water and uh, affecting um, endangered species. And then in 1978, we finally have the term called environmental racism, which finally begins to look at the disparities of low-income minority communities of color and exposure to toxic chemicals. Um, and that's one of the things that we're doing today that the Farm Worker Association is doing is fighting environmental racism. And we're part of the international fight for environmental justice of farm workers. So next slide. Okay, thanks. And then in the 1980s, um, we had um, the big um, agricultural boom and the subsequent, subsequent crash. Um, and the farm crisis of the 1980s led to a real decline of rural communities, which we're seeing again today. Um, it's also, I, it's really important to look at that as a key to our political climate today with how rural communities became, became, became alienated. Um, and we have one of, that was part of the beginning, including the Reagan administration, um, of some of the, the beginnings of the divide between rural and urban communities. Um, and then we had the Central American crisis. Um, we had the US influence to curtail left-wing movements in support of neoliberal policies deregulation, privatization, and globalized free market markets. U.S. intervention in Latin America had a big influence on the issues of immigration we see today. Um, we were there pushing for policies and leaders that upheld our views of capitalism, leading to instability, civil wars, exploitation, and much of economic and cultural unrest that has led to today's migrations. And today in Central Florida, our agricultural community is increasingly more people from Honduras, El Salvador, and um, Guatemala. Um, there still are, are a lot of Mexicans in agriculture, um, and also a large um, uh, people from Haiti are also part of the makeup of farm workers in the area, our, our area of Central Florida today. Um, so uh, Monsanto continues research for new products 
that resulted in the first field test of agricultural biotechnology. I'm saying all these things, and I'm going to come back to this at the end when I talk about some of the work that the farm worker is doing to fight this um, industrialized, globalized, um, profiteering, colonialized system of agriculture. And that fight incorporates fighting racism. It's not just a matter of agriculture. It also incorporates fighting the racist system that our, our agricultural system is based in. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this is the military-backed coups, corporate plundering, and neoliberal sapping of resources played a role in the poverty, instability, and violence that now drives people from Central America to the United States. And we all know what our immigration policy is doing to these communities right now, many of whom are still stranded on the border, facing horrible conditions. And that's really key and important to the the sentiment of our communities of farm workers in Florida today, uh, the fear that they feel, the separation of families. So next slide. Okay, so this is really key, and this is kind of what all this is leading up to. We're at a critical moment. We have protests in the street for Black Lives Matter. We have, um, you know, a People being people saying that COVID is a hoax. Um, we have to understand where all these policies fit in that in what's happening today. The North America Free Trade Agreement um, drove people from um, Mexico into the United States. Migration increased um, significantly after NAFTA was passed. We have these protections, uh, worker protection standard, the Food Quality Protection Act passed. In 1999, we had the um, mass protests against the World Trade Center. Very similar to some of the protests that are going on in the Northwest today. And we also began to have what has um, continued to this day, the merger of some of the biggest pesticide companies where we used to have three big pesticide uh, six big pesticide companies that are now merged into three companies that basically control a huge percentage of our worldwide seed, fertilizer, and all agricultural products. Um, next slide. And today we see the effects. So a lot of the pesticides that were used during World War II have been made into a chlorpyrifos, um, came from um, a, um, a gas that was used in the Vietnam War, um, and um, pepper spray. All, a lot of these chemicals were used in military actions in Central America and in World War II. And now we see them today in our protests, our Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we see violence and systemic racism, um, displacement and migration. We see a dependence on agrochemicals and that affects climate change. So one of the things that our organization is doing right now is really trying to address the issue of agriculture and climate change because agriculture presents one of the biggest um, problems, biggest um, drivers of climate change. And yet it also has the potential for some of the biggest solutions for climate change by carbon sequestration if we would change our entire uh, agricultural system. Um, we have broken regulatory systems and, um, and um, uh, market control. Um, and the domination of the um, seed market, it focuses on commodity crops like soybeans, ma maize, wheat, and cotton, and increased militarization of domestic control tactics a uh, pepper spray becomes the main law enforcement tool, uh, which originated as a pesticide. So next slide. This is where we're at now. We're at a fight against racism. But this fight against racism is also a fight for our entire planet and for people um, around the world. Um, some very bad pesticide products have been banned in other countries, but they're still being used in the United States. 
including atrazine and paraquat, two really horrible pesticides that continue to be used in agriculture. We have a growth of the organic industry, um, but that's not anywhere near fast enough to address the issues that we have. Um, people are trying to reclaim small farms and local economies and food sovereignty, um, but we still have yet to see what the impact of this um, crisis will have on that. It could potentially open the door for significant change, um, or it could just be fueling the power of the big corporations. Um, so we'll follow the money and keep making noise. Um, so you can show the last slide. And I wanted to thank um, Dominica from, uh, um, from um, Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides for that slideshow. Um, so I think that really helps to center where we're at right now. Farm workers feed the world. The US government called them essential workers and said that they could continue working during this pandemic. So they're continuing to work because they need money. They don't have a safety net. They never had enough wages to be able to put money aside. And they continue to work at great risk to themselves and to their families and to our healthcare system. I'm sure you've seen the pictures of the meat packers in the processing plants, the meat processing plants around the country and the spike in COVID cases. Um, in the meatpacking um, plants and how those workers got no, um, no protections, very little protections. And here we are today where we have a, a federal government that has not promulgated um, regulations. They have recommendations, but no regulations to protect workers. I had somebody call me on Friday complaining that their place of work, their nursery where they work, was not using, that some people at the nursery had been um, contracted the virus. And there were like two people that had the virus and the employer was not putting in any protective measures. And he said, you know, he, he demanded that something get done. Well, sadly, there are no regulations, there's only recommendations. And OSHA has been very weak on this. Um, OSHA has not come out with any um, enforcement measures or any regulations that they even could enforce. And so people continue to get affected um, by the virus. People have asked to um, what's happening in Central Florida. And I will say one of the reasons I have a mask on today is because we're currently doing a research project with Emory University. The project was originally to look at the effects of heat stress on long-term kidney, kidney damage to farm workers. But COVID has changed all that. And so our research participants are now coming in and getting questionnaires around COVID. Two people that came in today to our office were COVID positive um, and had, had, gone, had gone through that. Um, we have another woman, uh, Ubalda, who has been involved with their organization for a good 10 or 15 years, and everybody on the staff just loves her. She's um, just an incredible young woman. Well, no, she's not young anymore. An incredible woman, and she had breast cancer and is undergoing treatment for breast cancer, which many of us feel was related to her years of pesticide exposure in the nurseries. She tested positive. She was in here one Friday about two weeks ago and she learned that weekend that she had tested positive for COVID. The doctors told her she could no longer continue her chemo chemotherapy until she was free from the COVID. So our staff has been extremely worried about her, um, trying to do what we can to help her. Um, and so um, it, it's getting, it, not only is it rampant in Florida, but of course it's increasing among farm workers. And we were quite incensed by our governor who um, after opening up the state to um, more lax social distancing and then saw spikes of the virus, um, positive cases of the virus in farm worker communities, 
who basically disparaged farm workers and kind of blamed it on them for their um, poor housing conditions and said that they were packed into the trans into the buses um, like sardines um, when it's those conditions that farm workers have to endure so that the rest of us can have food to eat. And yet our governor was putting the blame on farm workers. I'm gonna say, you can go ahead to the other slides. I'm gonna show the, wanna see the last few slides. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the Farm Worker Association. Um, uh, and if you, do you have the pictures? Up? There we go, okay. Yeah, the next slide. So um, let me just say some of the things that we're doing. We, we are a very grassroots group. Our um, staff members are former farm workers themselves. We have five offices in the state. Um, we do everything from working with people individually. We work on local, state, national, and international policy. Um, but we also really care about the people in our communities. This is Jessica in the, on the right-hand side. Um, at a nursery, um, one of the local nurseries, passing out masks. We've got lots of mask donations. This is Jessica passing out masks to farm workers. Um, all of our five offices have been using precautions. We have been going to the, um, to the nurseries and to the fields, um, orange groves, fields, um, to help um, get personal protective equipment out to workers. The problem is, it's hot outside. This is Jessica again with some workers on their lunch break wearing masks. It's hot outside. Workers tell us that their employer will give them a mask at the beginning of the week. Well, you know, those surgical masks are only supposed to be worn once. And after an hour working in a nursery or in a field, that mask is dripping wet and dirty. And the workers complain and sometimes they're torn the workers complain that the, that the masks, you know, are, are almost useless. Plus they make you very hot. I'm hot now with the mask on. Um, so it's very difficult, but we, but people are also very afraid. Hortensia um, was, was calling me um, several times because a person at her place of work was tested positive. And she wanted to know whether she should continue working or not. Well, of course I can't make that decision for her but she was very afraid and did not want to continue working. Um, so the growers um, do a minimum amount and you have all different kinds of growers. Some are um, more conscientious than others. Workers say that they may get a pair of gloves, um, but again, after like a couple of hours, the gloves can be torn and you don't get a second pair until the following week. So next picture. In addition to that, um, we have a lot of people whose hours are cut, um, and this is also off season. So as everybody knows, it's really hot out there. So um, it's very hard to grow crops. Uh, food crops are not being grown in the summertime. Um, nurseries are still operating, but on shortened hours. So we have been getting once a week food, huge food donations from a food bank in Okoe. And once a week, we've been having big food drives at our office in Apopka, giving out food to some 250 families a week. And we've been taking food to our office in Pearson and giving food to about 140 families a week there. So that's a huge help. Next slide. These are our, our volunteers and our community members um, giving out the food. The, oh, um, yeah, that's another one. Thank you. Um, that's our um, some of our staff and some of our volunteers giving out food. And it's interesting to know because I'm sure people heard about um, the fact that um, when COVID first hit, it, hit, it um, disrupted all the supply chains. So a lot of food was rotting in the fields. The boxes that you see there, the white boxes, are part of the USDA program to get that produce from the farms to people. So those boxes have um, dairy products and fruits and vegetables and some meat products in them um, that was part of this USDA program to, um, to take the food from those supply chains and get them out to people. So next slide. In addition, here's two of our community members in our office where I am right now. Um, we're also getting donations of clothes. Um, and normally, um, 
you know, we get too many clothes, but right now with people being out of work um, or working less and having such an uncertain future, we have clothes donations um, that people can come in. When they come in for other services, they can come in and, um, and get, um, get clothes. The next slide, please. We've done testing. Um, this picture right here is the uh, Orange County Health Department um, that came in and did a day of testing in our office. And I think they tested 180 people in one day. And the next slide um, will show, um, well, that's, that's also the US, um, the, the Health Department doing testing at our office and they use protective equipment and social distancing. And, and, um, and I got tested there, so that was good. Um, and the next slide will show we were also part of, um, these are community members waiting outside when we had the University of Florida here doing testing as part of a pilot project that they were doing. And they're going to be, the people that were part of that test are going to be followed for a whole year to see um, about antibodies and if they contract it again and if there's any kind of long-term effects from the virus. Uh, next slide. And we've also been going to protests. So this is um, two of our community leaders, uh, Linda Lee and her granddaughter, Cheyenne, at a, um, a rally that Senator Geraldine, uh, Representative Geraldine Thompson had in Ocoee um, during the Black Lives Matter um, um, protests in Central Florida. And we were there supporting, supporting this. And next slide. We also have a community garden. We actually have four community gardens at our, f four of our five offices in the state. And our community gardens are a way to get fresh, involved community members in growing their own food and organically, sustainably sharing seeds, exchanging cultural um, practices, and learning about agroecology and food sovereignty. Not only is it, play, is it a place where people can come and be outside and be safe because we're outside and we're practice social distancing, but it's also a way for people to learn to grow crops and some of them will take that home or have taken that home and started gardens in their, own, um, in their own yards so that they can have methods um, available for the duration of this crisis and have learned techniques for future crisis, which I hope we don't have. Next slide. So other things that we're doing is in our office, we help people with food stamp and Medicaid applications. We received um, some grant money and some donations to help people with their rent and utility payments. And we'll see what happens with that when what Congress does in the next couple of days, the clothing donations. We've done a lot of informational um, uh, projects. Um, we've developed, I think, close to 12 videos in Spanish, Creole, and in the several indigenous languages that we've put on social media to tell people how to protect themselves from COVID. We're working with two um, clinics. Um, the UCF Medical School is working on setting up a telehealth clinic here in our office. We're working with 26 Health, which is an LGBTQ clinic in downtown Orlando. We're still figuring out, out the details of how to do that, but we hope to be offering telehealth here in our office in the next month or so. Um, and um, it's important, so our, our organization is um, intent upon understanding the impacts of the virus on farm workers in our area. Unfortunately, reporting isn't that great, so um, it's hard to get a handle on what's happening in um, some areas of Florida where there is very little oversight. And then we're doing um, policy work. So this is where folks can come in and help join us. Um, we had a Zoom call with the Commissioner of Agriculture, Nikki Freed, about two weeks ago, and we're in the process of um, advocating for a task force to be formed, and she seems very sympathetic to that, where we can work on farm worker issues with her, including heat stress and COVID. And the next slide, please. Okay, so are farm workers essential or expendable? Okay, they were told that they are essential workers, but they've been treated like they're expendable workers. 
So here is some legislation that we are supporting. And we, you, you can write this down. Um, and, and I haven't seen anything in the last week or so about where they stand. But the HEROES Act, which I'm sure you've heard about, heard about the Farm Labor's Protection Act, the Food Supply Protection Act, and the USDA Commodity Credit Corporation funds. So um, those are um, actions that people can support. And, um, and next slide. And you can um, join, sign up for our news alerts at info at floridafarmworkers.org. And we can send you our news alerts and our action alerts about any of these um, issues. And um, yeah, and if you want to donate, you can go back to the other slide and you can see where to donate, either for our, um, our disaster response fund and we have a mural project that is to capture and um, um, and the legacy of the black farm workers in the Popka. And we can really use the money for that too because we are want to help pay our youth artists that are working on the mural project. So uh, last slide. And we'll end with this. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that's what we're here for, is to fight for justice for farm workers and justice for everyone. Black lives matter, brown lives matter, justice for farm workers. Thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions. This was trying to cram a whole lot into a short period of time, so I look forward to questions. Um, you're, you're on mute. You're on mute, Russ. There you go. You're still muted, Russ. There you go. How about now? Okay. Good. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jeannie, again, uh, for um, giving us uh, a, a, a talk that informs us all, opens our eyes, and, and um, you really are an inspiration. Thank you. Um, I'm, we, do, we don't have a lot of time, but I think we have, probably have time for um, a couple of questions at least. So uh, I'm going to uh, ask Kristen Hughes, who's a member of our tech team, if he will choose a question to start us off and uh, read it and um, we'll go from there. Thank you, Russ. Uh, and thank you, Jeannie, for an incredible talk. Um, brace yourself, fasten your seatbelts. We've got some questions for you. Great, I'm ready. So how is COVID-19 affecting farm workers? We heard some of it in your talk. Um, there have been news articles about the concern and that there were problems and that they would be spreading uh, COVID as they went north to pick. So there's also the regional transmission issue. Um, what can you share with us about specific things that are happening uh, to address this problem with the farm workers? Right. So that's a complicated answer um, because um, farm workers are very concerned about it too. Um, some farm workers are actually afraid to travel up the seasons. Normally, they would be uh, some the mi true migrants would be traveling up to New Jersey, North Carolina for the season. And a lot of them are, um, have, have not traveled this year because they're afraid of that. And the ones that have, you know, there's a real risk to, um, there's been outbreaks in Maryland, for example, and, and um, Virginia. Um, a lot of those are in the chicken processing plants, um, but some people have traveled up to, to those areas too. There hasn't been the, the um, contact tracing um, that there should be. So we don't know exactly how much it's spread. We do know it's spreading in families in Florida. So for example, here in Apopka, we know that um, when, this shows how important messaging is, when the um, state quote unquote opened up, um, people got the message that it was okay. And um, now there's places um, in our area that our, our staff people know where whole families are infected because one person got infected and the whole family got infected. So they're not all trying to quarantine, which makes it really, really difficult. So the answer is it's bad, but then it's bad in the whole state. 
So um, how much farm workers themselves contributed to that? And, um, I mean, the work conditions are definitely not conducive, but also the opening up of the economy was a big factor in that. And um, far, Florida is different than a lot of states because a lot of farm workers in Florida are here um, like eight or nine or 10 months out of the year and don't migrate. But the ones that do migrate have been, it's been kind of half and half whether they decided to migrate or not. So as a follow-up, I grew up in upstate New York, uh, and I'm, I'm very aware of the cherry and apple uh, crop harvests uh, and grape. Um, as the transmission, as, as farm workers in Florida are, are identified as being a hotspot, <clears throat> there's been talk in New York about actually blocking the borders to transmission from people from Florida and other states coming north to those jobs. Uh, which is causing great consternation for farmers and harvesting in the upstate New York. Uh, but it's also taking away the livelihood of families that are seeking to migrate. Um, so is there a response to that uh, by the community or by the labor, by the union uh, or by the Farm Workers Association to try to address these access issues or border barrier issues? Well, we just, um, we give people the tools that they need to know that what, what's necessary to protect themselves. And then they make the decisions. I mean, just like all of us, you know, it's a decision on one hand of your health or your economic situation. Um, and it's hard to tell people that they should, they can't migrate or they shouldn't migrate because they need the income. Um, so it's pretty much, I mean, we give people the information, sound information, um, just trying to dispel the myths. There are lots of myths going around in the Hispanic community. Um, about the COVID, um, including some conspiracy theory type things that are going around. So we try and dispel all those different kinds of um, myths and then give people the information that they need to make those kinds of decisions. It's really tough because again, that's another disruption of the supply chain because you have, um, you know, the, the, the farmers that need to have their crop harvested, and yet you have the risks to the workers and a risk to the general community. So um, there's no clear answer to that, um, but that's why we're trying to do everything that we can to try and have support mechanisms in place for people that um, don't migrate and that might be, that might have the virus um, so that we can help them in whatever way we can. Thank you. I, I don't know if that's the we, best answer, but. We've got We've got several questions on a similar topic. Uh, one is how comfortable are farm workers seeking medical help? And then is medical help readily available? Those are two really good questions. So in terms of whether um, farm workers are afraid to seek medical help, some, the policies of this administration have made undocumented workers who are already afraid because of their undocumented status even more afraid than ever. Um, some people might be aware of the thing called the public charge, which was a rule that this, that, well, the public charge has always been there. Um, it's, uh, it's around um, services for immigrants. Um, but this administration has made it more strict so basically it's saying things like if you access public services, you could risk your immigration status. In reality, it only applies to about 700,000 people in the United States, but, um, but it's out there and people don't know that. So people that are eligible through their kids or their grandkids for Medicaid or food stamps are afraid to um, access them. And in answer to the question, some people are even afraid to get health care because of things that they've heard about the public charge, because they're afraid that it's going to affect them, that that'll put them on the radar screen for immigration and that they might get detained or deported. So it is uh, been a deterrent for people to access health care. And then in terms of um, is there access to health care? It depends. You know, Florida is a huge state. and it's very different. So in the Popka, we do have um, more access to healthcare. We have the farm worker clinic in the Popka. There's one in Winter Garden. There's actually about 12 in the area that serve low income communities. But up in North Florida and some other rural areas where there aren't those kinds of services, there's a lot less access to healthcare. And then a lot of farm workers are um, 
don't know how to access it, and they don't know how to talk to their healthcare providers. There's language barriers and cultural barriers that make even um, healthcare that is available very difficult for people to get. And that's a long story. So I could talk for hours about that. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of uh, follow-up questions to your talk. Um, do you have any common product names for the uh, pesticides or the chemicals that you were talking about, the chloro dot 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 question marks? Chlorpyrifos? Um, yes. That, that has lots of different, um, so let me think, I don't, I don't know what the common, uh, some of the, chem the product names would be. But chlorpyrifos is very common. It's, um, it's, uh, I can email um, some information about it. We have a big campaign against chlorpyrifos. It's really bad. It's related to ADHD, um, learning disabilities, and autism. And there's um, a study in California called Chamacos, which has linked um, children in rural agricultural communities with higher levels of exposed to chlorpyrifos and organophosphate pesticides. They're linked to uh, having much higher levels of learning disabilities and ADHD and autism, which is really significant because a lot of times farm workers are, are blamed for being, you know, um, you know, uh, less intelligent or not as, you know, uh, having, you know, mental problems. But a lot of that can be related to the pesticide exposure. I mean, we feel a lot of it is related to pesticide exposure. Thank you. Yeah, if you could, maybe if you could send us a couple of those names, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, We've had someone who's asking the question, could you explain the term neoliberal, uh, as in neoliberal sapping of resources? Sure. Actually, I do remember one product name, Durzban and Lorsban. Um, ah, so people right. might know those. Yeah. Um, Durzban and Lorsban, that, that was actually banned in um, 2001. Um, for, for residential use, but it's still used in, in agriculture. Wow. Well, wow. neoliberal policies are policies of um, uh, globalization and market capital um, that have affected our economy and, and um, has expanded the, the capitalist system in the United States. Um, some of those policies are the ones that led to the interventions in um, Central and South America, uh, Central America, and uh, it's neoliberal, neoliberal policies um, of letting the market um, control, um, it, you know, having market control that's allowed the big corporations to um, gain power. So um, yeah, neoliberal policies, really a culmination of our um, capitalist system and, um, and the, the apex of our colonial system um, basically given free reign. Thank you. Um, kind of to follow up on that, do you receive legislative support or any legislators in Tallahassee who you see as champions or help advocate for the policies you're advocating? Right now we have, um, in 2019 and 2020, we had a heat stress bill in, and I didn't even talk about that. We have a heat stress bill in the state legislature. Um, we tried to get it passed two years in a row um, this past, well, yeah, um, in 2020, this year, um, Carlos Guillermo Smith was the sponsor in the House, and Victor Torres was the sponsor in the Senate in Tallahassee. We also had support from uh, Ana Escamane and Geraldine Thompson and a few others, but those have been the key ones in Central Florida um, that have helped with um, with that. And um, and also, um, they have also supported other uh, farm worker issues as well. And, Do you and know? Actually, go ahead. Just really quick. It's really important to understand about heat stress and climate change too. That's a really big campaign of ours. I didn't put it in here because we were talking about pesticides, but that's a really huge issue that we're working on too. Uh, it's really significant related to climate change and environmental injustice. So yeah, thanks. Do you know if Monsanto is selling treated seeds in the United States, just as they are in the world poor areas? Yes, uh, they are. The plants don't produce viable seed or small farmers to use uh, the following years instead of having to purchase more from Monsanto. Yes, uh, Monsanto has got made, especially in um, corn and soybeans, it's just horrible. They are a huge monopoly on it. Um, I was at a conference in Minneapolis several years ago 
we went out to a big farm. Luckily, he was a really nice farmer, um, grew corn and soybeans, and he showed us the seeds. And the seeds are actually, there's a, a class of pesticides called neonicotinoids, and the seeds are actually coated with the pesticide. So it's not even that the pesticide is sprayed on the crop or, or, or pellets put on the soil, it's actually on the seeds. So those pesticides are systemic in the food that we're eating. So Monsanto mm -hmm. has a huge control um, and we fought, that's a long story too, we fought vigorously against um, the Bayer-Monsanto merger. We worked with Friends of the Earth, um, was one of the lead organizations on that. And we really fought very hard for several years to stop that merger, but of course it went through. So yes, they have, they still have a huge control on the seed market. Okay, um, one more question and uh, then um, we'll say good night. Are farm workers eligible for unemployment benefits? If they're undocumented, they're not eligible for anything. If they're, if, so the answer is no, which is, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that's like the key point for this, this talk about farm workers are considered essential, but then they're not, if they're undocumented, they don't qualify for anything. They don't qualify for unemployment. They don't qualify for Medicaid or, Medi or, or, or food stamps or, um, or rent, you know, anything else, any, of, any other programs that the federal government or state government have. And yet they are the backbone of our food system. Just one last thing, Russ. Um, yeah. If people would like to be on the mailing list for the organ for the association, if you could type your email address into the chat window on your Zoom meeting, um, we are we'll be able to capture your email address and be able to send uh, copies of the association's e-news, which will keep you updated on actions that Jeannie just talked about. Yeah. I, I like to point out that, that uh, the Farm Workers Association is uh, one of the organizations that our Social Justice and Environment Committee has pinpointed as, as uh, an organization that, that we are dedicated to help. And Russ, I would um, hope that we could put mm -hmm. on our uh, UUCLC website the addresses that Jeannie gave so that people sure. can find them there. Well, I, I'm not going to promise that. I'll see. I'll see if that's okay, possible. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, again, again, a heart, heartfelt thank you to you, Jeannie, and uh, to all who have attended this talk. Uh, it is truly uh, inspiring to see how high the interest is in social justice issues in our this beautiful part of Florida that that we live in. Let's make it a, a beautiful place for everyone to, to be in. I'd also like to give some thank yous uh, to Jane Hepting, whose hard work made this series possible, and to Val Rosado and Kristen Hughes and the technical team who works very hard to master the challenges of technology and make this program work for us. Join us again on August 16th when our speaker will be Cassandra Brown. Cassandra is president of the American Civil Liberties Union in Central Florida. Her topic will be, what makes our criminal justice system so unjust? Until then, thank you for coming and let's keep the light of social justice burning. I will extinguish the chalice and wish you all a good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening.